Uh, I'm going to have to skip out, uh, but Donna is expecting to come later. I would just remind you again, uh, try, try to remember to fill out the ballot in the middle of your book uh, after today's session if you have not already done so. Uh, maybe do the other ones. We'd like to collect those next week uh, and tally them so we can share with you sort of where your opinions are uh, and how those stack up against uh, the opinions that the Foreign Policy Association has already collected uh, from participants in great decisions groups across uh, the United States earlier um, this year. Uh, so unless, Rosalie, there's anything further, I think we'll get started. Thank you. Where did you say our next meeting is? I'm sorry. Next week is in Kennedy Union, the student union, ball, Kennedy Union, not in the ballroom. It's in the Bowl Theater, which is on the first floor. Uh, if you go in the front doors, uh, it's up a level. If you go in the back side, this side of it. Uh, and uh, the information desk. Yeah. It's, it's right opposite the information desk, right, right adjacent to the copy center. Uh, the box office for Bowl Theater and arts events on campus is right there. So it's uh, about as easy to find as almost anything uh, on the campus. So without further ado, Liam. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kant. Uh, I see you're voting with your feet. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can't make an omelette, right? Um, I, I appear to have all my gadgets. I, I mean, f back in the day, you used to be able to do a talk in front of a group of people with a piece of chalk and this sort of stuff, but nowadays you need all sorts of gizmos and things. This is just something that allows me to sort of do a bit of showbiz on, on <laughs> moving from slide to slide, and then I've got my, my doodah here. Um, I don't know if... I, I tried to embed a couple of short video clips on some of these slides, and I, I don't know if I'm that good um, that they're actually going to play or anything like this, but we'll see, you know. Uh, anyway, <coughs> I wonder if um, people might recognize uh, the infamous reset button. Um, and this was basically when the, the Obama administration came into office and pres uh, President Clinton, maybe in the future, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Um, basically, this was, a, a, I guess, a publicity stunt. Um, to, the, to change relations entirely with Russia. In other words, relations have got to such a bad state of affairs between the Bush administration and Russia that, that this was a clean break with the past. And so she, she even bought this. I mean, you can see it there. The, the, I mean, it was a bit of a cheap stunt, but somebody probably should have checked the translation because the actual translation of this means overcharged. It doesn't mean reset at all. It means overcharged. Uh, and so... Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, got, got ridiculed somewhat in the, in the, in the Russian media for this. Um, but, you know, I think it was an important gesture, let's say, if a little theatrical, just a, you know, a, a good way to start off the administration because fundamentally the differences between the United States and Russia, uh, I would say, are less deep than the similarities for, across a number of different issue areas with a lot of common ground that could be explored. Um, I think the pro part of the problem is I don't think... Russia is a very easy country to empathize with. Uh, and there aren't many people, I mean, if you're a liberal, a lot of liberals don't like Russia at the moment and the direction Russia's going because they look at someone like Vladimir Putin and they see basically a, a dictator with a smile, uh, occasionally a smile at least, um, but a dictator by any other means. And so they're concerned about civil liberties, civil rights in Russia, this sort of thing. A lot of conservatives are still fighting this. You know, the Cold War, where, I mean, literally, there was a physical barrier separating communist Europe from Western Europe. Uh, and for, I mean, there's a very strong mindset in certain think tanks in Washington that perceive Russia to be, um, well, to understand Russian history as just relentlessly expansionist. And that essentially what Russia does, is it goes through periods of strength and weakness. When it goes through a period of strength, it expands. In weakness, it contracts. So what we're going through right now is a period of Russian weakness. Once Russia gets back on its feet, it will you know, return to its expansionist ways. And so Russia never changes, essentially. Russia's always been evil, and Russia always will be evil. So there isn't a lot of sympathy around. There aren't too many groups of people, I think, that are prepared to be very empathetic about Russia. So I'll try at least to, to uh, put across what I, I would consider to be the Russian perspective on, on uh, international relations and relations with the United States. Um, this is where we're going to go in the end, but let's start with uh, a face we should all recognize. This, incidentally, just in case, and for any conspiracy theorists here, um, this identifies Mikhail Gorbachev as the Antichrist. Um, 
<laughs> Seriously, I mean, there is a book out there that's been read by over a million people that that's apparently a map of Asia uh, and the Antichrist, when the Antichrist returns, returns with a map of Asia tattooed on his forehead or something. So apparently, um, Mikhail Gorbachev is the Antichrist. But what he, I guess what he's better known for is being in, at the wheel when the Cold War ended. Um, and not only, <clears throat> I mean, this is the sort of the, the good bit of the end of the Cold War, which is smashing down the Berlin Wall. Uh, I mean, this, I, I mean, when I talk to my students at Wright State, I, I, I always make the mistake of saying, I'm sure you remember this event. <laughs> and of course, you know, some of them weren't even born when this thing, and it, those that were two years old, this probably, you know, was, was, flew beneath the radar screen. But at least with this audience, I can say, you probably remember these events, right? Um, you know, I was, I was actually at university doing a course on international relations, and one of the courses was on NATO and the Warsaw Pact, when all of this started coming apart. And, and essentially, we, I mean, pretty much the day after the war comes down, I go back into class and the professor gets up there, rips the syllabus up and says, we've got to make it up as we go along now, guys, because there's no more NATO, or there won't be any more Warsaw Pact, probably no more NATO. I mean, this, this stuff were really earth-shattering events, really, in, in a very short space of time, and for the most part, very peacefully. And a lot of that, I think, is due to Gorbachev on the, on the plus side, because Gorbachev, when he had to make, make a decision, do I send the tanks in, do I not? He chose not to, and he let the people themselves decide. So kudos to Gorbachev for that. What he didn't expect was this, that the, and that was certainly not what he intended to do. He was prepared to sacrifice Eastern Europe to preserve the Soviet Union. And so anybody who, want, I mean, Gorbachev himself now makes the case that, of course, well, of course I understood the Soviet Union had to come to an end and it was bad. And what, that's absolutely untrue. At the time, he did everything he could to keep this thing together. So this was the former Soviet Union, splits up into 15 different republics. You can see we've got Central Asian countries down here. We've got a um, strange little country, Moldova, over here. The um, Slavic states, Belarus and Ukraine, and then the Baltic states up here in the north. Transcaucasians here. So Soviet Union splinters into its 15 constituent units. Um, and of course, everybody lives happily ever after, right? I mean, the assumption uh, at the time was, you know, we're going to get a repeat of what we got in Eastern Europe, which is that once people are, rem or tyranny is removed from people, the tyrannical thumb is taken off people, then their natural state of being, which is basically lovers of liberty, democracy, all of this sort of stuff, just takes over. I mean, we made exactly the same assumption in Iraq as well, that the barrier to democracy in Iraq was um, this tyrannical, oppressive leader. Once you remove that, people return to this natural state of loving democracy and whatever. Um, didn't quite work out like that in most of the Soviet Union. The exceptions up here are at the Baltic states, really, uh, which are now members of the EU, members of NATO, and various other things. I mean, they've done pretty well. Um, but really, of course, if you look at the scale of Russia relative to the other republics. I mean, Russia, I think now is still something like 11 time zones. Um, you know, you can fit more or less three United States into Russia. I mean, this is a, this is a huge country. Population's probably about 145 million. Massive resources. It's going to be an important player. And the question is, well, what happens after this? Well, this is what we get. Um, <laughs> now, history, I... I it's a bit, I, maybe a little early to tell how history is going to judge this man. Um, I think in the West, he tended to be seen as the, the big hope for Russia. He was the, uh, the, the Democrat uh, who was going to reform the, the, the Russian economy, and he was going to stand up to the communists and battle the communists and transform Russia forever. And then at that point, Russia then moves on to, to its sort of promised land, as it were. Um, <laughs> sorry. I mean, with, with all due respect to Boris Yeltsin, um, I mean, that, that, would be, that would be an early morning tipple for him, a bottle of vodka. He actually, I mean, drank two bottles of vodka per day. I mean, this was a serious, a serious alcoholic. I mean, um, I don't know, can you turn, can we get volume on this? Let, let me just show this. I mean, this is um, Boris's greatest hits. If we... Can we, is, is it possible to turn it up a little? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
can we, can we get, is, there, is it possible to get some more volume on this? We, we can't hear Boris's dulcet tones. No? Okay. Okay, so, so I have to lip sync. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, you, you missed his, his, he has a truly appalling singing voice, it has to be said. I, I think, um, I mean, the problem with Boris Yeltsin, I mean, that was obviously uh, designed to have, you know, to show portray Boris as having a bit of fun and all of this sort of stuff. I mean, it starts to get a bit more serious when you think about this guy having his finger on the trigger of 6,000 nuclear weapons, uh, probably 10 of which are pointed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, um, that he's drinking two bottles of vodka a day and had three heart attacks during the 1990s and was a manic depressive. Um, you know, it's a little more sobering. But there's also... Um, there was more to um, Yeltsin's democracy than meets the eye, because th this was a little-known event, really. I mean, it was not covered in the Western media at all very much. It happened in 1993, and this was essentially a, Russia's civil war. I mean, it was a minor civil war, but what happened was the communists who were elected to parliament, so you have a par parliament, Russian parliament dominated by communists, you have uh, Yeltsin, the reformer, the Democrat, the liberal Democrat, as the president, so that they're, they're locking heads over economic reform. Um, Yeltsin can't get any of his stuff passed through the parliament, and so he says, fine, we'll just ignore the parliament, and he starts issuing decrees. So he starts ruling by proclamation, basically. The, the, the communists in the parliament say, you can't do this, the, there's a constitution, we have a constitution, you are not allowed to do this. So they occupy the parliament building uh, and basically declare themselves that, that they are ruling the country from now on. Uh, and of course, they're absolutely right constitutionally because Yeltsin did not have the power just to, I mean, it would be like President Obama today starting just issuing orders around the place instead of laws. Um, so the communists were actually right in this case. Um, but of course, the communists are the communists, right? Uh, and Yeltsin's the reformer, the Democrat, whatever. And so what Yeltsin does is he basically calls in the army and starts shelling the parliament building. I mean, tanks start firing shells into the parliament building kills about 150 of the people sitting in the party who are holed up in Parliament. Uh, the rest surrender, and that's the end of the incident. The question is, at this point, you know, if you're sitting in the West, you're trying to make a decision, okay, who's the right side to be on here? Are you on the side of the communists who happen to be behaving like Democrats on this instance, or are you on the side of the Democrat who happens to be behaving like a dictator in this instance? And it's a, it's a tough decision. If you're sitting in the West, you know, who do we throw our weight behind? In the end, the US threw its, and most of the West threw its weight behind uh, Yeltsin. Um, and I think there's a lot of ill will, let's say, in Russia about that decision. I mean, realistically, it's a very difficult decision. Um, but in the end, the US went with you know, the, the, the Democrat acting like a dictator. And the reason was, you know, basically the idea was to get rid of, to smash the communists, ultimately. Um, <clears throat> The problem was, of course, as the, the, the reforming of the economy, which is, I mean, a major part of it was privatizing, because under the Soviet Union, of course, the, the government, the state owned absolutely everything, uh, all the productive enterprises and non-productive enterprises, I should say. Um, and so part of the process of economic reform involved privatizing all of these state-owned industries. Now, a lot of Russian industry or Soviet industry was, was not very productive, let's say. In fact, in terms of manufacturing, I mean, the Soviet Union managed to achieve this. It was absolutely staggering achievement that the products it made with raw materials that it mined out of the ground, that the end product was worth less than the raw materials were prior to the, the manufacturing process. So the, the, the Soviet manufacturing, in a lot of cases, was value subtracting, uh, which is an astonishing achievement. I mean, it takes, it takes some... But, of course, it didn't matter in the Soviet times because... You know, you, you've only got one type of fridge to buy. The fact that it explodes after three months, you know, doesn't matter. Everybody's got to buy it. No, you know, if you complain, it's not going to happen. So it doesn't matter. But it does matter when you think about which enterprises and industries can, can actually make a profit come uh, in a free market. So the privatization process was handled, in fact, largely. The, the advisors were uh, at Harvard. There was a special center set up at Harvard. They got a grant for a... Uh, something astronomical, $100 million or something, 
to advise the Russian government on privatization. Um, there's a lot of underhand stuff going on during this process, including the fact that Harvard's endowment increased by about five billion uh, while its guys were advising the Russian government on which assets to sell off and getting the inside information on which assets to buy shares in and this sort of stuff. Some of the advisors from Harvard actually walked away with hundreds of thousands of dollars on the basis of investments they made on the basis of their advice to the Russian government. And again, this just isn't widely known. I mean, it, but it's quite widely known in Russia. It just isn't very widely known here. So again, there's sort of resentment. But I think that the worst bit of this um, pr whole process was there were two phases to the privatization process. The first phase was sort of selling off the mom and, mom and pop stores or the small scale industries. And then Russians were basically all given vouchers um, that, were, that represented a share of total wealth of Russia. So you, you, got, you, you, went, you, know, you got sent through the post, you got your little voucher, it was worth about $33. And the idea was you're supposed to go to an auction and buy a share in a company, and therefore you become an owner in the, sh in the company and whatever. But of course, you know, if, if you give somebody a piece of paper and say, that's you know, one 300 millionth of a share in the, what, what, what does that mean? You know, I mean, how do you, if you've never lived in a capitalist system, I mean, most people in, who have lived in a capitalist system, you give them a piece of paper and you say, that's one share in, of the wealth of the United States, go and do something with it. You know, not many people would know what to do with it. If you've lived for, under communism for 80 years, what does this piece of thing mean, you know? So what happened was speculators stepped in, they bought up all the shares. I mean, there was an exchange rate of shares, bottles of vodka to share. And uh, I mean, uh, about six months into this process, the exchange rate was two bottles of vodka for one share. And so people sold their shares for peanuts, speculators sort of marshaled them all together and bought up all the productive enterprises. So they basically, um, I mean, it, it, the productive enterprises were skimmed off by speculators. But the big stuff, the raw materials sector, I mean, where, where Russia's wealth really is, um, was basically creamed off by these guys, what, what, who came to be known as the oligarchs. And this was the, the second wave of privatization. You may have heard of some of these figures. Um, Mikhail Khodorkovsky is right now rotting away in a Siberian prison. Um, for, I mean, depending on who you listen to, um, for, as a totally, totally innocent man, um, or as you know, a big threat to, to Russia, the national security of Russia, depending on who you listen to. The, I mean, the truth is this guy is, a, is, I mean, got wealthy through crime. But he got wealthy through crime at a time when everybody got wealthy through crime. So the question is, well, you know, should you pick on somebody just because he was a criminal when everybody was a criminal? Um, but there's other things. He probably ordered the deaths of several people and this sort of thing. So, you know, he has murdered people. Um, so he's, but some of these other guys have also done the same thing, and they're not in prison. Um, Berezovsky uh, and Gusinski are both kind of in exile. Roman Abramovich, if you know anything about English soccer, owns Chelsea Football Club. Um, and he's, he's fine because he didn't cross Putin. He just smiled and kept his head down. So he's got about six yachts. I mean, he's, he's hugely wealthy. These guys bought up, got wealthy basically in 1996 because they owned banks. Uh, the Yeltsin was running for re-election to become president. He needed money. So he goes to the banks and he says, guys, I need, you need to lend me money. And so the banks say, oh, fine, okay. We'll take shares in raw materials sectors. So we'll take shares in... Uh, nickel sector, in the oil, gas, this sort of stuff. Um, and then if you, in the event that you don't pay us back, um, you know, we'll just keep the shares. And that more or less, I mean, it was a bit more complicated than that, but that more or less is what happened. The banks lent money to Yeltsin for his re-election campaign in 1996 as the president. Um, the government couldn't afford to pay back the loans. And so these guys basically inherited uh, or bought, I guess, or, uh, the, the, the raw materials, all the raw materials industries in in, in Russia. And so this is why you get in, a, in amongst, I mean, this is the distribution of billionaires by location in Europe. So the, the, the taller the column, the more billionaires there are. And you can see Moscow has more billionaires per square inch than any other city on planet Earth. More than any city in America, more than any city in Europe. I mean, London's probably next best. Uh, no, I guess that's probably Berlin uh, or Frankfurt or something. But a lot of these guys, yes.
Well, I, I think a lot of the worry about communism was that, that communism is an inherently expansionist ideology. And so if you're on the outside looking at this, you know, you're worried that these guys want to spread their ideology. You know, free market, I mean, this is just basically greed, and this is self-interest and greed, um, and that's what drives the free market. But it's not, a, it's not that anybody, they don't want to take you over. They don't want to expand and, and force you to do things. I mean, so I think it's less threatening to those outside. It's just pretty unfortunate if you're living in Russia. Um, because you've got billionaires here, Leningrad probably, or St. Petersburg, I should say, uh, has a few billionaires knocking around the place as well. Outside those two cities, Russia's in desperate straits, basically. It's, it's a very, very sad place, which I'll show you. And it's miserable as hell. But, but this is, I mean, just to give you an example, these are Yukos, I mean, I mean, we're talking about here about world-scale oil companies. I mean, we're talking about BPs here or, or Chevrons or whatever. I mean, we're not, these are not little things. So the, the, the value of Yukos at the time, 1996, was estimated at 20 billion. Uh, Khodorkovsky got this for, for 300 million. I mean, that's still a chunk of change, right? But um, it's not anything close to what it should have cost. Um, and so, and again, you know, the Russian people are watching this unfold. From, from the Western perspective, you know, you're seeing when it, the actual, the, the assessment was at least these things are going to people who have good business brains and this sort of thing. They may be crooks and whatever, but at least they know what to do with their money. If you're sitting in Russia, you're watching the family silver being sold off to crooks uh, who are then basically using the, the money and investing it anywhere but Russia because nobody's investing in Russia at this point. So the money's flooding out of Russia. The social network's breaking down. This is a bad time to be a normal Russian. It's a great time to be a criminal. Um, and so I think, I mean, if we're going to summarize, the, as part of the, um, the, the Yeltsin's economic legacy, and I, I'm being maybe a little harsh on, on Yeltsin here, but um, he basically took it from the Communist Party bosses who ran the show, often for their own interest, but also, I mean, Communist Party bosses generally didn't have six yachts. You know, they may have a small boat somewhere in the, in the Black Sea or something, or, uh, and a country house and this sort of stuff, but it was pretty low-level, you know, luxury, let's say. Um, and so the economy was run, you know, in the interests of, communist, of the Communist Party sort of elite. And what Yeltsin managed to do through this process was take it from them and give it to crooks, essentially. Um, is that better? Is that worse? I, much of a muchness, really. I, 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 you know. So if we <coughs> look at it, and, and it's unfair to blame all of this on, on Yeltsin, certainly, but um, if we look at his legacy, this is... I mean, this is, you know, after, uh, we, we didn't go into detail in, in the, the economic process, but essentially what happens is the state collapses. The, all the state services break down, so the healthcare system used to be pretty good in, in, under, in Soviet times, the education system. All of this is breaking down because the, the, the government can't afford to pay the people to work because it's not getting taxes, because all the industry is owned by criminals who aren't paying any taxes. Um, and so, essentially, you get this into this vicious cycle where the, the, the social network totally breaks down, basically. Uh, there are no jobs available. And so what you get is this sort of catastrophic decline, and this is Russian male life expectancy. Uh, and if you look in the, this is in the mid-1990s, down to here, from where it was. I mean, I mean, in a space of about five years, life expectancy for males declined by 10 years. I mean, it's an astonishing um, figure. I mean, it recovers, has recovered a little bit since then, um, but you know, most people who've looked at this say this is a purely Darwinian thing, that basically the weaker have, have all died off, um, so that you know, the, the, what remain are the stronger members of the society. Most of this is due to alcohol, and most of the alcohol consumption in Russia, which is again, I mean, it's always been pretty heroic uh, throughout Soviet history, but uh, you know, since 1991, when the social network breaks down, you can't get a job, you can't feed your family, whatever, you turn to alcohol, it's estimated that about a third of all Russian males are alcoholics, and that alcohol is responsible for the 80% the, uh, of the murders that are committed in Russia. A fifth of women are alcoholics. And so, you know, a lot of parts of Russia where the industry that kept the town or the city afloat has collapsed because nobody wants to buy the products, and so there is no industry left, you have nothing else to do. And so people are basically drinking themselves to death in these places. Uh, that's pretty cold as well. And so, translated, that looks, I mean, this is, uh, again, it's not a very clear, but this is the population decline in Russia from 1991. So, it's basically, Russia's lost about six million people. 
or actually it's close to 10 million people since 1990. So since the end of communism that should have ushered in the, the good times and whatever, uh, essentially 10 million, the Russia's population has shrunk by 10 million people. Part of this is to do with abortion rates, which in Russia are off the charts. Um, it's the highest rate of abortion of anywhere in the world. And again, part of this is to do with the fact that people can't afford to have children. And so abortion's kind of seen as the easy way out. Um, I mean, there's some staggering figures. The average Russian woman has three or four abo abortions in her lifetime. I mean, it's just the average woman. So the Russian government started to try and pay people to have babies. Um, you know, I mean, not insignificant, sort of $1,000 a month in, in some cases, things like this, to, just to procreate, to have children, because Russia's a dying country. Um, and that's cheery, isn't it? I don't... Oh, this is really relentlessly depressing video excerpt. Uh, let's, let's not watch this. <laughs> I was sorting these out and, and I was last night and I was watching them. I had to watch them all, obviously. Um, and by the end of it, you know, I was just about ready to, to, to take, get the old razor blade out. I mean, it was, it was miserable as hell. But, um, so here's what we got basically by the end of the 1990s. And again, not all of this by any means is Yeltsin's fault, but I think a lot of Russians perceived it to be Yeltsin's fault. And not just Yeltsin's fault, but Yeltsin's fault in conjunction with the United States of America, who had backed Yeltsin to the hilt during this process. And, and so in a sense, therefore, and I think very obviously unfairly, the United States was implicated. Yeltsin was seen as the, the America's man at the helm here. And so um, we've got all of these problems. We've got a you know, third of people below the poverty line. All the services are gone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you've got, I mean, the guys who own everything. The, the, I mean, I guess it's a bit like... Uh, Prime Minister Berlusconi in Italy, you know, it's that, it's that sort of uh, level of Im embedding in there. So, you know, I think Boris is not Russia's most popular human being. In fact, I think they've done polls of this, who are the you know, two most despised human beings in, in Russia, and uh, it's basically Gorbachev and Yeltsin are the two. So. Okay, um, well, Gorbachev was general secretary of the Communist Party. So, and at, in that position, basically, he was in charge of all of the Communist Party bits in all of the Soviet Union. So that, that was basically like boss of the Soviet Union. And uh, Yeltsin was the elected president of Russia. Yes. So Yel Yeltsin actually was pop, you know, popularly elected within Russia. Gorbachev did was, um, he was general secretary of the Communist Party, which traditionally was, you know, the top in the Soviet Union, but he then sort of declared himself president of the Soviet Union, but he was never elected. And so essentially what happened was there was a confrontation between Yeltsin and Gorbachev. Um, and it was, you know, it was a power struggle, essentially. Um, and I mean, the, I don't know if you, you remember the, the coup that took place where the communists tried to um, take power back from Gorbachev and put him under house arrest while he was on holiday. Uh, and Boris Yeltsin came flying to Moscow, got on tanks and started rallying the people to, to thwart the, the communist coup. So he sort of made, transferred himself into a, a hero like that. But I mean, the truth of the matter is, I mean, the Soviet Union ended because Yeltsin, uh, the leader of uh, Belarus and the leader of Ukraine, or I think Lukashenko and, you forgive me if I can't remember, the leader of Ukraine in um, 1991, sat down, got drunk, and signed a piece of paper to say the Soviet Union has ended. Well, I mean, more or less, without Russia, without Ukraine, without Belarus, there is no Soviet Union. So they signed this piece of paper and said, we, you know, we're not leaving the Soviet Union. That was it. And then Gorbachev suddenly turns around and he's, you know, he's the boss of nothing anymore. So that's really what happened. It was a kind of personal power struggle in a, in a nutshell. <clears throat> so this is, um, I guess, how a lot of I, I would stress it's, 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 it's an unfair perception that it's, it has an element of truth, is how most people, most Russians perceive Yeltsin. He's staggeringly unpopular, um, and he's, America's kind of implicated in him. And part of this, in fact, is, if anyone gets a chance, it's called Spinning Boris. Um, and it was a film set in the 1996 presidential election, the, the Russian presidential election, where Yeltsin, Yeltsin's approval rating is at 3%. 
Um, so this is in 1996. And what the hell do we do? You know, we've got 3% approval ratings. We've got uh, an election coming up in, in, in eight months. Uh, the communists are at you know, 50%. I'm at 3%. We're going to lose. The communists are going to take over. They're gonna, there's going to be a civil war, something like that. So they actually called in um, <coughs> campaign experts from America, a team of campaign experts who advised Yeltsin on how to run his campaign and said, look, you've got to, got to go negative. And so they ran a series of campaigns in which showing churches being pulled down and, and violence and communists you know, lining people up and shooting them and saying, this is what you're going to be voting for if you vote for the commies. Um, and in the end, it was successful. So, you know, it was kind of, they were bailed out by American campaign experts, uh, his, his campaign was, in 1996. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's called Spinning Boris, um, and it's, it's quite entertaining. But this is, this will give you some sense. We've got a series of, uh, I guess, descriptors down here. What, what do you feel when I mention this name? And, and you can see the, the pink here is uh, Putin. Stalin is the, I mean, this is the guy who killed 30 men of his own people. Um, and the blues, Yeltsin. The only thing, Yeltsin beats everybody else on is dislike. Oh, sorry, and revulsion. Um, so revulsion, Yeltsin wins, and dislike, Yeltsin wins. Um, Stalin gets more respect for Yeltsin, and Putin gets more respect for Stalin. So you can see, you know, Yeltsin is, is held in lower esteem than Stalin. Uh, in Russia. So, um, it's the, the kind of corollary of that is that this guy is, is the hottest thing in town for most Russians, you know? Sir? Yes, it was a Russian uh, opinion poll. Some people... <laughs> Well, fundamentally, it was, it was a non-functioning economy under the Soviet times. So in other words, essentially, it survived on raw materials and exporting raw materials. I mean, if you've got endless supplies of diamonds and gold and oil and gas and whatever, um, you know, you can survive quite a long time without being very productive. But on top of that, it built this very elaborate social network. And so, you know, you've got free health care, free education, free housing, more or less, heavily subsidized food. Uh, he heavily subsidized utilities, free transport, all. So it was all, a lot of goodies, and nobody did much work in the end, fundamentally. So the economy was arguably non-sustainable. What's happened since then is the economy, I guess, for, with, by standard metrics, is better off. But what's happened is the distribution of wealth within the society has become, it's gone from being really pretty evenly you know, spaced to being totally ridiculously unequal. So you've got a very small number at the top with masses and masses of money. Some of the richest men in the world are Russians. And you've got quite a large number down the bottom with nothing, you know, who are living in the same sort of poverty as you know, parts of Africa. So that's, I mean, that's what I would say. For some people, it's been a really good thing. For a lot of people, um, it hasn't. But you could certainly argue that the system as it was was unsustainable in any case. But probably what should have been done, they should have done it a bit more gradually, maybe. Um, you know, let a, few gener let a generation die out rather than let them starve on the streets, maybe. So, but this, this is the, I mean, <coughs> here's Vladimir. He, he, gets, he manages to get himself dressed up to appeal to various segments. I guess there's the, uh, that's for the ladies. And there he is for the, for the, for the men, yeah, with his gun and, and showing that he, and he shoots tigers and he gets videos of himself in Siberia shooting tigers, so he's a hunter. You know, and I, I don't quite know, it's gay Russians or something, I don't know, I don't know who that's supposed to appeal to. But he, he's, this man is, is pretty, pretty popular. I mean, he's, I guess he's reviled by a certain sector of the Russian population. Um, there's a very liberal sector of the Russian population that really had high hopes of democracy and, and are, you know, interested in things like freedom of speech and the press and all of this sort of stuff. They really don't like him at all. But I think if you look at the opinion polls of his performance, he is a very, very popular human being in Russia. Um, he got to power basically on the back of this war. Um, and he, he was initially, I mean, Yeltsin, they were the pig's ear of this, this particular conflict. Russia had actually lost the first round of this to the Chechens. I mean, I mean you imagine how, how deeply humiliating that is for Russia. 
I mean, this is the superpower, former superpower, and it can't beat its own, you know, a bunch of terrorists in its own country. So Yeltsin presided over a loss for the Red Army in Chechnya. Um, Putin, when he became prime minister, and Yeltsin basically said, gloves are off, uh, we're just going to do whatever it takes. And so it became a very, very brutal war um, that involved large numbers of, of dead civilians and a lot of shelling of, of cities in Chechnya and this sort of stuff. But it kind of got it under control. Um, and frankly, the, you know, the Russians, this is uh, <coughs> the guy who Putin finally ended up putting in charge. I mean, he looks like some sort of, I don't know, some, some little thug um, who would probably sell you drugs or something outside a nightclub. But this is uh, Ramzan Kadyrov. Um, and he's not, I mean, he, he, he's quite, he makes the trains run on time, I think is probably the nicest thing I can say about him. He, He's a thug, basically. He has his own sort of militia army that goes around terrorizing people who step out of line. So it's, the place is run as a, as a pretty, um, well, as a dictatorship, essentially. But what he has done is he brought order to Chechnya. He is a Chechen, so he's, you know, at least Chechens are being brutalized by their own people now, rather than by Russians, is the thought. Um, he's a Muslim, and, so, and he's declared jihad on the jihadists, which I, I don't know quite what that looks like, but... Um, He's also polygamy and various other things. I mean, it's, it, it's a strange fish, but, um, but he, he's very effective. It's not nice, it's not pretty, but it's effective. Um, so Putin has really done quite a good job. Um, it, well, let me rephrase that. He's done quite an effective job. Not a nice job, but an effective job. And in the end, we'll end up doing something like this in Afghanistan, I think. Um, and then in Russia itself, this is what he refers to it as. He said, look, Democracy, I mean, the problem Russia had was we tried to reform the, um, the political system and the economic system at the same time. If you try and do that, the problem comes to reform the economic system, you've got to inflict pain on people. And if you inflict pain on people, they're not going to vote for you. So the two things are against each other. And so once, you, you know, once you're up for election for things, you, know, you lose your capacity to inflict the necessary pain on the population. So let's approach this in a have a democracy, let's have elections, let's have all of this, but let's make sure it's not sort of one West democracy and, and, you know, let's keep it under control, as it were. And so this is what he sort of means by this. Um, it's, he sort of reined in the oligarchs again. He's gone after some of them who crossed him, and he's taken back some of these resources, natural resources. Um, he's, uh, he, when I say controlling the press, the press is very free as long as you don't cross certain um, Like, the, the, Putin's not very tolerant of journalists going to Chechnya to report on human rights abuses in Chechnya, things like this. So anything to do with national security is kind of off, off limits. But, you know, you can read, Moscow Times is a new English language newspaper published in Russia, very good newspaper, and that's pretty, of Putin and all, you know, and it's published every day and it's not shut down and whatever. So it's probably freer than we, we and then, Political reforms we don't have to go into, but this sort of cult of personality, which, uh, <laughs> and you can see what the, the impact of this is. This is the March 2004 presidential election. Vladimir Putin, and this is the, his, uh, I mean, it's a political party, but it, it really isn't. It's, it's a sort of, uh, it's a vehicle. It doesn't really have an ideology other than we love Vladimir Putin. Um, so it's basically supporters of Putin. Um, you know, you could get its political platform or its ideology on the back of a postage stamp. Um, you know, there's, there is, there's no ideological content to this party. Um, but 72% of the vote, I mean, not even, I mean, the commies were down here somewhere, I mean, not even close. Um, in fact, I mean, after the commies, nobody gets, nobody came, comes third in this election. And then Medvedev, who is uh, Putin's sort of chosen successor, uh, sort of inherited the popularity. So, lost a percentage point. Um, appointed himself Prime Minister. <laughs> is the one who's supposed to be appointing him. So these two are now working in tandem. Uh, but you can see, I mean, these are generally free and fair elections. These aren't staged elections. Uh, they're not rigged elections. There's a, I would say that the Putin, or the Kremlin at least, has um, a slightly unhealthy degree control over the media, but, you know, the, the, 
they're freer and fairer elections certainly than Afghanistan uh, or than Iraq for that matter. So this isn't, um, this isn't some sort of tin pot banana republic democracy or anything like that. And this I was going to show a video, but if we haven't got any sound, there's no point. Nashi is a sort of uh, youth organization. I should choose those carefully here. Um, Nashi just means ours. Uh, it means sort of us. Um, and it's, a, it's an organization that was created by the Kremlin. Um, so Putin's guys sort of created this thing. And it's, uh, it's somewhere between, it's like a sort of aggressive version of, um, I don't know what comes after the Boy Scouts, but, but what's next? In Eagle Scouts. Okay, so I mean, these are mainly young people, teens, things like this, who get dressed up in their, you see, the, they idolize Putin, so they've got Putin's visage on the back of their jackets camps to sing praises to Putin and whatever. So that, I mean, it's a kind of like a nationalistic Putin, Putin sort of youth movement. Uh, of course, some people rather like the Hitler youth to me. Uh, I think it's a bit harsh, but I mean, it certainly fostered this idea. And so for these people and a lot of Russians, this that's leading them back to deserve to be in the world. Temporarily, um, the U.S. managed to sabotage Russia's greatness by working through this evil guy, Yeltsin, uh, and they succeeded for 10 years. Now this guy's, this guy's in town, and this guy's going to stand what's bad and wrong with the world and, and restore Russia to its rightful place in the world. That's how a lot of Russians actually see it. Um, it doesn't matter that, that, that Putin's in charge. I mean, in a sense, I, I, yes, but for, for reasons we may not think about. This is P Putin's approval ratings. Um, you know, the last approval rating he's had, I mean, it's, it actually went up. This is only goes up to 04, but 66%. But it's generally in the 70s, 80s, whatever. And Russians typically dislike almost everything about the Russian system of government. As a person, as an individual, Putin remains staggeringly popular. And one of the places for this, this is the economy under Putin. This is the economy under Putin. Um, you know, various reasons for this, but again, perception is Yeltsin almost destroyed Russia and Putin sort of the of Russia. <clears throat> I don't care that, you know, freedom and, and freedom of the press may not be absolute and this sort of stuff. You know, why should we? Well, one of the reasons we might is because I would say Putin's a lot better than what else might be out there in Russia. Uh, quite a lot of extremism in Russia right now. And I think what Putin does is he sort of takes the steam, he's like a lightning rod, he takes the sting out of some of this extremism. Um, because he's nationalist enough that it satisfies a big chunk of the population and prevents them from moving towards the extremes. There's, there's a lot worse out there, trust me. This guy, Eduard Limonov, uh, I mean, you can see this is, I mean, it's a bizarre concept. It's a basically a fusion of communism and, and fascism. It's trying to sell. You may be familiar with the name Vladimir Zhirinov, who was uh, his part liberal Democrats, um, but they're not liberal and they're not Democrats. Um, they're sort of virulently nationalistic. Uh, and things that they have policies after the Soviet Union to, uh, you know, to, to allow the Red to be in the Indian Ocean, various other things, to take back Alaska. Uh, is one of Zirinovsky's campaign pl pledges. So that um, <coughs> if, we, if we didn't have Putin, you may lose Alaska, guys. I mean, this is, this is where we are. So I think what, from this perspective, I mean, this is the, we tend to think about Russia as this sort of aggressive, perennially aggressive thing. I mean, Russia is kind of a wounded country right now. Um, and so I guess if we want to empathize a bit with them, that, 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 that they're angry, and, and resentful from a, from a position of weakness. Um, and, and if you think about it for a second, it's very easy to, uh, to, to, to grasp you from being a superpower to you know, a third world country five years. And everything you've been told throughout your youth about how the Soviet Union, how it's advancing towards the communism, how it's, you know, everything's, it's, it will prevail against everybody in the world, blah, 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 all of this sort of stuff, you realize it's a total tissue of lies. You know, everything that you've been taught and told and you hold dear has suddenly been taken away from you. Um, I mean, it's going to be minimum disorientating. Um, there's a time, I think, to lash out. And I think 
part of it is this sense of being under siege from outside. I mean, this is Russia here. If you think about where the US has got nukes stationed all the way around. I mean, if you see it again, if you, if you put yourself on a map of during Cold War times, shot from above the Earth, um, depicted from above the Earth, what you'll actually see is Russia and then all the way around it, more or less, NATO, or wet pro-Western forces. So viewed from their perspective, they're surrounded by um, claim not to be the enemy, but, but then why are they surrounding us? Um, <coughs> and we won't have time to go through all of these, I don't think, but um, let, let me just go through a couple of these. I mean, Kosovo, um, uh, again, I mean, this was kind of one of those wars that people have forgotten, but um, deeply remembered in, in Russia. Um, so there's Serbia, Kosovo. If we remember, Serbia is Serbian and Kosovo is mainly Albanian, so we have this ethnic difference in Serbia. Um, this is the KLA who started an uprising against the Serbian government in Kosovo. Um, we, I guess we chose to see them as the heroes of this, as the sort of freedom fighters and all the rest. Um, so we backed these guys against Milosevic's government. Um, <coughs> the US tried to negotiate a, a sort of of this war, and so we had the Rambria Agreement, basically, that had these terms. And really, the, the agreement was given to the Serbs and said, all right, you sign off on this, we'll start bombing you. Um, well, I mean, the key sticking factor was, um, where is it? There you go. NATO forces into Yugoslavia with unrestricted access. As part of the agreement. So, in other words, Milosevic was expected to sign something that allowed enemy forces into unrestricted access. I mean, he was never going to do this. And so um, we ended up bombing Serbia for 78 days and then declared victory, essentially. Um, and I think one of the issues, and, and this is something that I mean, Europeans in particular, very double standard, huge double standard on this. The, the Kosovo conflict, NATO bombed Serbia for 78 days without any sort of approval by the United Nations. In other words, NATO fought a war against Serbia without even, they didn't even take it to the United Nations for obvious reasons that Russia would have vetoed the action. Um, but France and Germany were part of this. France and Germany were fantastic parts of this. So when it comes to 2002, 2003, and the United States, um, and, the, you know, and, and the argument on the part of the French is, well, we can't violate the sanctity of the United Nations. If you don't get the Security Council resolution, we can't support you, and all of this, is dross, because the French were quite happy to bomb somebody in 1999 without the UN Security Council signing off on it. But what it means, of course, is that this is an un, this was the first one, in fact. This is the first action, um, aggressive action on the part of the West, really, on part of NATO, out of area, out of its NATO area, without UN Security Council approval. Um, the problem, I think, was this, and you look back now, it's, it's a bizarre war, because the, the reason why there was evidence of mass growth and all of this sort of stuff, well, there wasn't more evidence, at the time they claimed was, well, A, there's been a, there's a concerted effort to hide all of the hundreds of thousands of bodies, and also it's too cloudy, we can't see them. This was the, the evidence, and I remember in the NATO press conference, the guy getting up and saying, oh, we've got evidence that, that there's mass graves here and there's genocide going on and all the rest of it. Um, and we estimate, the estimate was something like 200,000 people have been slaughtered, um, you know, and it will only get worse unless we do something. Turns out, of course, this is a, it was a potato field or something. I mean, the, the, the total number of people killed in the entire conflict on all sides was something like 3,000. Now, so that's Serbian troops dead, that's everybody dead, whatever. So in other words, there is no genocide taking place. And so, from the Russian perspective, at least, I'm from the Serbian perspective, the question is, why do this? You know, what's this all about? Um, and, and, you know, I, I think probably they still haven't had a good answer yet. Of course, the KLA went on the rampage um, and started going after, I mean, these are all, in Kosovo, these are all Serbian Orthodox churches that have been fired to and destroyed in Kosovo since uh, the Kosovo conflict ended. We now have Kosovo with the Serbian population of Kosovo sort of been driven into this northern bit here. Um, so I, I, I'm really, I think this is a, a not, not a particular war, this one, I have to say. Um, and then 
In February 2008, Kosovo declares independence. Um, it says, no, actually, you're still part of us. You can't be independent. Uh, and it kind of splits the world on who, to, who recognizes Serbia and who doesn't. So those countries in the green, so it's basically quite a lot of Europe, uh, well, most of Europe, Canada, US, a couple of South American countries, Australia, whatever. They, uh, all the gray countries, gray countries recognize Kosovo as an independent country. And the argument of the gray countries, I mean, the argument of the green countries, the best argument is we can't think of anything else to do with it. Um, the gray countries argue this sets a really bad precedent. If you allow countries to become independent against the wishes of the country to, of which they're a part, then you know, you're just going to set off a whole uh, redrawing of state borders throughout Central Europe, if not the world. So the countries that are all refuse to recognize Spain's an interesting one because it has its own problems with its own minorities. And at some point, at some point, they may want to break away from Spain. Spain may not want it. Why shouldn't the Catalans have their own state if the Kosovars get their own state? You know, why shouldn't the Hors have their own state if they so desire it? Why shouldn't the Scots have their own state? Um, so where does all of this stop? Well, Vlad here <coughs> in, in <coughs> hunting sharks in Siberia was the reaction and um, I, I think he, in some ways he's absolutely right you know this this was this was a change in the international order the, I can't think of a prior to this Kosovo the, the last time I think uh, the world in general a chunk of the world recognized the independence of a bit of territory against the wishes of the parent territory was probably Pakistan East and West Pakistan in 1970s so it had been 40 years probably since at, this had happened Changed the world somewhat. Missile defense is another one, another bone of contention. Uh, or the at least is that, that and Poland, Poles and Czech, Czech Republic want the missile defense system to be built in Central Europe here, uh, but Russia doesn't. Um, the US wants to build, it's going to be, I think, the radar is in Czech Republic and the intercept is in Poland. Is the missile threat. And so the argument is. So the Russians, it's got nothing to do with you. It doesn't affect you in any way, shape, or form. And the Russians say, well, not now it doesn't. But once you have the interceptors in place, once you've got a system that's working, the only thing that stops this being used against us at some point in the future is the number of interceptors. So once you've perfected the technology, of course this system can and will be used against us. So they are somewhat reluctant to enforce a system like this. And in fact, they say, if you start putting this, installing this system, we're just going to load up on missiles pointing at Poland and the Czech Republic. So nuclear missiles pointed at Poland and the Czech Republic. Um, <clears throat> well, this, I think, is, again, it's, it's a sort of term beef. Um, I mean, this is where we are now with NATO expansion. We've got all of these, all of the countries in the blue. Um, and again, this is the perception, at least in is that there was a, a deal done uh, in 1990, which was Russia would not oppose, or well, Soviet Union as it then was, would not oppose the reunification of Germany, and that, that Germany, a unified Germany could be in NATO, if the borders of NATO, eastern borders of NATO, doesn't go any further east. So that's, the perception at least was that that deal was struck, that that, that was an end to NATO expansion, certainly, in, in, in return for a united Germany. And so, Letting these countries in is seen as a betrayal of that deal. Now, the parties involved on the, on the U.S. side don't think that there was any deal about that, but that's certainly the way the, the Russians see it. So we've now let in Poland, Czech Republic, Romania, Bulgaria. Um, I mean, to put it in perspective, most of the countries through which Germany invaded in 1939, or 1941, I should say. Um, several of the countries which participated in the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, including Romania and Bulgaria. Soviet Union in NATO. Now, I, you know, if NATO is a sort of, I don't know, a, 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 a club, a, a gentleman smoking club or something, it's not a problem. The problem is NATO, if you admitted to NATO, it, it, there's a serious commitment on the part of the other members involved here. Um, and this is the serious commitment. It's Article 5 of the NATO Charter, which says that attack on any member of NATO to be an attack on all members of NATO. So all members of NATO 
the defense of the attacked nation. What's the purpose of NATO? I mean, in the end, NATO is about the US providing a security guarantee to Europe. Because no, no there was any doubt that if a European country were attacked, it's not like Belgium was going to come you know, rushing to the rescue, right? It was going to be the US. So this is fundamentally a guarantee on the part of the US to defend any of member of NATO against an external attack. If you look at the people here in the States, they were, that Poland was admitted to NATO, American people were asked, um, would you support the US going to war to protect Poland against an attack from Russia? 15%, 15, 15, 15.15% of Americans supported that. Well, that's Poland. I guess there aren't that many Poles in, in America, but uh, that's Poland. People have heard, they can point to it on a map, right? I mean, you ask people about Lithuania. Would you support the United States going to war to defend Lithuania against Russia? I mean, I, 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 I just don't know. And this is Estonia, and this was an incident that happened in Estonia. Exactly the sort of incident that could end up, you know, involving the United States in a war with Russia to protect Estonia. What happened was Estonia has a big population of Russians, 40% of the population. So the Estonian government basically has been a bit provocative in its dealings with the Russians. And they would argue, of course, well, the Russians were fairly, <laughs> didn't treat us very well in, in the past either. But um, such, for example, that Russian is not an official language anymore. So the Russians all have to learn Estonian um, to get jobs and things like this. The, the, the Red Army soldier in, in the center of Tallinn um, that was erected the, the two um, to celebrate the sacrifice of uh, Russian and Soviet troops in defending the motherland, etc. Et the Estonian government decided to move it from where it was here to the center of, I mean, it's sort of a park out of the way somewhere. And this provoked in the on the part of Russians in Estonia. The question then is well, when you get this sort of response from the Estonian government, so you've got the Estonian government basically using tear gas, firing water cannons, and and rubber bullets and things like this against crowds of Russians protecting, you know, the Red Army statue. I mean, it's two stages away from some sort of conflict there, right? You're only a stage away from Russians getting involved directly in this conflict. And from there, you know, you're there, the next stage is Estonia says, I'm being attacked by a member of NATO. Look at Article 5, come to my rescue. And then you've got a difficult decision to make. This is why... Number two here, I mean, number one, I think it's always a good plan, you know, it's much better. I think the I mean, contrast, um, after World War II, the French wanted to dismember Germany. They, were, they wanted no more Germany. The United States and Britain to a certain extent, but primarily the United States said, we're keeping this place together, we're going to build this place back up, you know, a book against communism and all the rest of it. Didn't not humiliate the loser. The US transformed the loser and two losers of World War II, two most, most important losers of World War II in 2010, third and fourth richest countries in the world, primarily as a consequence of the United States. So it's not about humiliating them, it's you know, changing them into sort of extremely successful um, countries. So I think we, did, we didn't do that with Russia and I, don't, I think there's a legacy we just don't trust them, you know? They're once a commie, always a commie, something like that. I, I think we, there wasn't the commitment there to doing, to helping Russia in the same sort of way. This is the one that, that really, uh, I think, because the, this, the important visible commitment is to let Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. So let's, uh, states, Estonia, Latvia, Latvia, done deal, there's nothing we can do about it, they're in, right? But the question now is, Georgia and Ukraine, do they get into NATO? To let them in is to give a visible statement that arguably you already know you're not going to keep. I.e., would we really go with Russia to protect Georgia? I, I, I mean, I would. I really don't. Why would you risk landing on America to protect Georgia? That's what you would have, I mean, sir. Yes. If they're economically 
But the European Union is no threat. That's the difference. The European Union isn't, isn't perceived as a threat. There's no, um, there's no mutual defense commitment within the European Union. You, EU is non-threatening. Sorry? Is the European Union a confederation of states? I, it's somewhere now. I mean, it's short of that. I, I, you try selling, you would, you would get a there in Britain, I can tell you. Um, now, it's, if in, in, in trade relations, it's, it functions kind of as a single unified space. But on political issues, it's not at all. And on security issues, it's nowhere near being that. Um, you know, Britain and France have their own nuclear weapons. You know, they're not European nuclear weapons. They, they, the Britons, Brits would decide whether to use them or not, as the case may be. So I, I think there isn't the same issue with lending them into the European Union. I think the Russians wouldn't have a problem with that at all. So. Uh, well, no, I mean, most of the countries are also packed and now in NATO, so uh, there is, uh, and we, we may get to it, but I, uh, I mean, I, let, let me just, I'll return to that point because I'll finish up with this. I mean, this was the war, in, yeah. Yes, go on, go on then, have a break. <laughs> 